Al Jazeera's Hashem Ashelbara has covered extensively <clears throat> the instability in Sudan, and he joins us now. Um, Hashem, among the things that you've been working on uh, the last, what, 24, 48 hours is these jailbreaks and who's been released from jail, what it might mean for the country's future, what it would change the, the political landscape. One name, Hame Haroun. Who is he? One of the reasons why people are pretty much concerned when they saw that audio tape from Ahmed Haroun about him leaving the prison is basically this is a key architect of the old political establishment that prevailed in Sudan for more than four decades under President Omar al-Bashir. And people insisted, the pro-democracy movement in 2019, that all those people should be prosecuted, sent to jail for the atrocities committed against the Sudanese people and for the embezzlement of public funds. One of them is Ahmed Harun. And Ahmed Harun has been on top of the list of the former ICC prosecutor, Luis Mourinho, uh, Ocampo, he has been accused of committing atrocities against civilians in Darfur back in the early years of 2000s. Now, why people are concerned? Hamiti, on one hand, is saying that Al-Burhan and his top lieutenants are allowing the former members of the old regime back into political life because they would like to build alliances with them to tilt the ground into their own favor. The army, on the other hand, blames Hamiti for colluding with the old guards we're talking about military officers, intelligence officers, tribesmen, clerics, all affiliated with the old political establishment. And they're saying that these are people who could stage a political comeback. We have to remind our viewers that back in 2019, when the pro-democracy erupted in Sudan, one of the key components or key demands of that pro-democracy movement is that Omar al-Bashir and all his aides should be sent to jail, should be banned from returning to political life, and should be prosecuted for all the atrocities committed against people of Sudan. So, in a way or another, there is a fear that the old guards could be staging uh, a comeback. So you're saying the fighting between the army and the rapid support forces could now <clears throat> reopen this space that had been closed ever since uh, uh, Omar al-Bashir was ousted? I have to say they tried to distance themselves from Omar al-Bashir, but they are a product of Omar al-Bashir. Hamiti was a product of Omar al-Bashir, the same thing for Omar al-Burhan. Both, they were promoted, they were given senior positions by Omar al-Bashir. Omar al-Bashir also was a product of a military coup. Sudan has had somehow 17 attempted coups, a record number in the African continent. And it's been run by the military almost all of its exactly. since, since independence. Exactly, since General Aboud yeah. back in 1958, all the way through Numeri, Sawar al dhahab and Omar al-Bashir. The only difference in 1989 was this alliance between Omar al-Bashir and political Islam, Hassan al-Turabi. Now, you could ask me why people are concerned. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates, post-2011, with the Arab Spring, mm. they saw an impressive rise of political Islam. One of the key bastions of political Islam is Sudan. And this explains why, right after 2019, we saw many regional key players providing significant assistance to, to Al-Burhan and Hamiti, hoping that these two key figures could ensure that political Islam would never stage a comeback to the country. And this explains why the narrative yesterday, since yesterday in Sudan, who is to blame and are they trying to stage a political comeback? Whose interest would this be in? Because you've got the two fighting sides, right? You've got the army under Mr. Rouhan, you've got the RSF under Hamidti. Who would have a strategic interest in perhaps seeing the renaissance of political Islam and the old guard? Both in a way or another, they would, they would benefit from this for the simple reason. Hassan al-Turabi was larger than life as, uh, as, as, as the architect of the political Islam in Sudan. And he managed to build alliances across ethnic lines, regional lines, uh, religious lines, and components of that status quo or that establishment are still in Sudan. Now, imagine, look at the situation now. Al-Burhan is quite obvious. He doesn't have really huge control over the military establishment and situation on the ground. Guess what? Tomorrow, with the backing from many people affiliated with the old uh, uh, old guard, mm -hmm. it would pave the way for him to stage a comeback, consolidate his grip on power. Hemeti understands very well this, and he knows as well that there's absolutely no way for Hemeti, someone who comes from Darfur, he's just beholden to one single family in Darfur, mm -hmm. suddenly you want to become president of Sudan. You won't be able to do Might this. You need to expand his power base. If you want to do it, you have to go back to the old guard that has been there for four decades in Sudan. You want to have their backing 
and you have to show loyalty for them to be able to stage a political comeback. So this explains why the story over the last few uh, hours in Sudan has been about where is Omar al-Bashir and where are his acolytes? Are they still in jail? And those who left, who was to be beholden response, taken responsible for this. And I think the narrative over the last All few right. hours is quite fascinating. It's about this ongoing political divide, but also about those who collude or pull the strings from behind closed doors. Al Jazeera's Hashim Ashelbar. Thank you so much.